Bonjour, uh, good afternoon, welcome. Uh, welcome to this um, first lunch briefing of the Grad Institute for this semester. My name is uh, Christine Lutranger. I'm the executive director of the Albert Hirschman Center on Democracy at the Institute, and I have the pleasure to moderate this event. Uh, welcome to our host, our guest speaker, Professor Mahmoud Mohamedou, who is professor of international history and chair of the International History Department. Many of you uh, probably already know him and know his work. He is uh, uh, also a visiting uh, professor in Sciences Po Paris. His research um, develops issues related to political violence and transnational terrorism on state building, on also on transition to democracy. He's the author of uh, many books, including a trilogy on the post-September of 11th area, including the much influential book entitled The Theory of ISIS, Political Violence and the Transformation of the Global Order that was published uh, in 2018. He's also a faculty affiliate of uh, several research centers at the Institute, including the Albert Hishman Center on Democracy and the CCDP, the Center on Conflict Development and Peace Building. With uh, his colleague, Professor Davide Rodonio, he is also he has been giving the, the course on an international history of racism. And it's precisely on this issue that uh, he will focus his presentation and the debate in this lunch briefing, which is a, a topic very relevant, of course, uh, to current affairs, but also to our work as researchers, scholars, students, and uh, as a citizen. So I, I think it's a, it's a very good start to, to address uh, this issue in international relations and unpacking the multiple dimensions that racism contains in, uh, in international relations. So the format of this lunch briefing is uh, of about 20, 25 minutes uh, presentation uh, by Professor Mohamedou. And after that, uh, we will devote uh, half an hour, the remaining time to uh, the question and answer, then to the debate with, uh, with the audience. So this, uh, this event is uh, recorded and it will be available also on uh, the YouTube channel of the Radio Institute. So um, when I will uh, take the questions, I will also uh, refer to your names and uh, to make it also more lively, you might also indicate from which place you are attending the, the discussions, because I guess uh, we have many uh, participants who are at the Grad Institute, who are in Geneva, but given that it's an online event, we might also have uh, participants from other parts of the world, where we are also very keen on engaging you uh, in, in this conversation and uh, in this event. So you may already start um, raising your questions in the uh, window that you can see on the right hand side of your computer and um, I will I will take them in the in the second part of the discussion. So that's it for the kind of organization of um, of the of the meeting and I leave the floor to to Mahmoud. Thank you very much Christine. Thank you for your kind uh, introduction. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be able to deliver this lecture uh, today. Also, at the start of our academic year, I do think, as you kindly pointed out, that it is an important and timely topic. It's an urgent topic in and of itself, uh, but I think it is very, uh, I think, a strong uh, signal and a strong uh, sort of message that this particular topic be highlighted as we embark on a new academic year. So my thanks to you, my thanks to the organizers, uh, Sophie Fleury and all of the colleagues who have kindly invited me to deliver this uh, lecture. Um, and my thanks to all of the participants who are kindly uh, tuning in uh, for their time. And I very much look forward to the uh, discussion. So as uh, Christine has indicated, um, I have some prepared remarks that I would like to present to sort of give us a sense of the issue. Um, and then uh, after that, I'm happy to engage in uh, a conversation, replying to the questions and comments. So um, 
the issue of racism uh, is characterized, um, if you think about it generically, by a sort of lingering paradox, um, which takes the form of centrality combined with invisibilization. So if ever the phrase, the elephant in the room had a meaning, it's really, or being appropriate, it's really in this context. Uh, that is something so obvious that is standing in our midst, and yet we avoid naming it because it bothers us, or because it bothers some. And this notion of bothering is, I think, what we need to puncture, to take further. The urgency that we spoke of, the relevance, is also essentially derivative of this notion of something that is problematic. But this paradox, this combination of centrality and invisibilization, it's not, it's not so hard to decipher, as it were, because the centrality, on the one hand, is a matter of an objective manifestation, that is, the long and universal history of racism, while the disappearing of the problem is the result of a conscious set of actions, um, that is, a, set, a process which is driven by political, ideological, personal uh, motivations. But it is also a process, and this is where we're heading with this conversation, that is informed by the manner in which knowledge is produced, or not produced, or produced in a particular way, as well as inaction, or moral cowardice, the ethical dimension oftentimes presides over this question, as we will see. So against this background, it may sound today surprising to speak of the masking of racism at a time when the best sellers on the Amazon.com list are all essentially in majority on racism. But in point of fact, demonstrably, the issue of racism was indeed until quite recently seldom featured in the mainstream public debate. Or if it were, as obviously it's an issue that has been discussed uh, um, in many places for a long time, it's discussed not so much in relation to its, it, the issue itself per se, and certainly not the international relations dimensions which we will approach, but in relation to discrete events, the problem in this country or the problem with this particular community or the legacy of that issue. That is the sort of um, generic uh, aspect of the problem and how it relates to the production of knowledge, as I'm saying, is something that paradoxically has seldom been featured. Indeed, racism arguably fell off the radar of international affairs since the 1990s or so. Obviously, the 60s and the 70s, and up until the mid 80s, you had the issue was present in the news and the developments, and therefore in the discussions and the debates. In fact, in the streets, marches, demonstrations, you had quite a few of these issues around the world, so from one continent to the other. But then by the 1990s, somehow it fell off the radar, as I say. And today, what we're witnessing is that a whole new generation is rediscovering the issue with a sense of urgency and a sense of brutality as it discovers the importance of it and the relevance to the world we live in. But such silence, sort of the systemic silence on this question, or silencing, or lack of attention, speaks to the depth and the continuity of the racial question. Long ago, it was thought by many to be the dominant issue of the 20th century. Famously, the African-American historian, the Harvard historian and sociologist, W.E.B. Du Bois, du Bois, famously predicted in 1903 already that that century would be, quote, one of the one of the color line. And the problem obviously did play out in that way, in that century. But the problem of the color line is still proving resilient with us today, in effect, in a resistant way in the early 21st century. And here we encounter the incipient question of narrative, that somehow many believe or have believed the issue to have been solved and therefore not deserving of attention. And this feeds into the denial of the problem in many ways. That perception might be an honest perception, might be a misinformed perception, or it might be an ideologically vested uh, perception, but it is a consequential perception nonetheless, because the issue of denial is itself becoming now part of the problem. In fact, it is arresting. There is no overstating, ladies and gentlemen, how much turning away, those turning away in the face of racial injustice or showing impatience and irritation, displaying knowing glances with those raising it are manifesting 
a form of racism far more insidious than the obvious KKK marches, or rather the neo-KKK as we've seen them in Charlottesville in 2017. This dynamic brings to mind something that the historian Amy Louise Wood called in her excellent book, Lynching and Spectacle, a phenomenon of a sympathetic spectatorship. And this notion fundamentally connects with this. And if anything, here's your talk. International relations have never taken racism seriously, and in so doing have helped fuel it further, leaving us today with a problematic and racism avoiding legacy. Two years ago, the colleagues at the Institute invited me to deliver such a lecture, which I had entitled back then in the face of the manifestation of, of these episodes, why is racism making a comeback? In that talk, I had argued that three phenomena presided over the current revival of racism, namely the negative exemplarity of a number of political leaders around the world, from the Philippines to the United States by way of Hungary, Brazil, and so on, the societal banalization that masks the extent of the issue, as we see it in Europe, as we see it in Latin America, in many other places. And thirdly, the intellectual rationalization, which enables its expression. We see it a lot in France, for instance. Two years later, things have continued and arguably have gotten worse. Let's examine the facts. Anti-racism protesters marching from Pennsylvania to Washington were shot at. This was not 1963, but 2020. Angry white parents picketing in front of a school in Maryland in opposition to desegregation measures. This was not 1973, but 2020. A family forced out on the ground and handcuffed by the police on account of a mistaken report of a stolen car. This was not 1983, but 2020. A university professor and her brother harassed by her own campus security and denied access to their premises. This was not 93, but 2020. A man walking to enter his car shot at seven times in the back by the police in front of his children. This was a month ago, after the world had been experiencing near daily demonstrations for the murder of another man back in May 25. On and on weekly. With by now the danger that we might be even numbed to this. There's a sense that this might be even counterproductive in the manner this is reporting, reported. But in the face of such American history, most of these examples, all of them, are from the US. European media and social media is full today of stories such as, isn't America such a terrible country? But this self-serving righteousness could not any more blinding. Two days after the killing of George Floyd, French police replicated the very same knee on the neck of a man in Paris. Needless to say, all of these men tend to be black or brown, as it were, and any majority men. Muslims in France have been at the receiving end of systematic and increasing racism since the 1960s, with episodes such as the October 1961 drowning of hundreds of Algerians still not dealt with fully by French historians or French academia for that matter. Anti-Semitism making a comeback in Europe and arguably never generally seized in many quarters across Europe. Generally, racism remains strong in Europe. But similarly, those beyond the United States and Europe denouncing the obvious cancerous racism in the West cannot ignore the racisms in their midst, even when members of their own societies are discriminated against elsewhere. Genocide in Myanmar, African migrants enslaved in North Africa, Asian workers discriminated against in the Gulf, Muslims denied citizenship in India, Africans experiencing witch hunts in China and Russia, to name but a few of these incidents around the world, and not to forget the racism in Brazil or the anti-Roma, anti-Gypsy discrimination across Eastern Europe and beyond. The litany of incidents serves really no other purpose than provide factual evidence for us of continuity. And these incidents, as they were playing over the years, many dismissed them or simply did not pay attention to their consequential global international relations dimensions. And so those today that would like to see them not for what they are and dismiss them will do so with a Trumpian kind of fervor and a sense of righteousness for sure. Indeed, in many quarters, what we have been experiencing in recent months, as it were, is that the anti-racists are the ones on the defensive. Several officials across a number of countries have criticized those denouncing racism and a number of intellectuals themselves have engaged in criticism of movements such as Black Lives Matter or human rights movements in Brazil, for instance, with a view to deflate the issue or to taint it. 
This past June, 15 French scholars wrote an op-ed in the French Daily Le Monde to criticize the French President Emmanuel Macron for his silence on victims such as George Floyd in the US and Adama Traore uh, uh, in France, a Frenchman who had also died in the hands of uh, the police. And President Macron's attacks on intersectionality, which is a concept that has been gaining traction in uh, social um, science, what he termed, what the president termed racialized discourse. Macron's words are important and weren't uh, quoting. He specifically attacked academia saying the following, the academic world has been guilty. It has encouraged the ethnicization of the social question. The outcome can only be secessionism. That's a pretty strong world. This amounts to the breaking of the Republican too, end of quote. In one go, we have here the time-tested fetishization of the Republic, that same Republic, which has a colonial past, given a blank check on its own breaking in not two, but of several parts, and an alarmism tantamount to an invitation to censorship, if not self-censorship, as it were. So all along in all of these years, two things have materialized with a certain urgency, a normalization of the issue across the board and an empowerment of those willing to deny it at the highest levels, as we've seen obviously with President Trump. This now, ladies and gentlemen, is the problem of contemporary racism, generically. Let us now turn in the second part of this discussion to the specific question of racism and international relations. A coupling I understand here, both in, the, in terms of the practice of international relations affairs, as it were, generically in international organizations, in the practice of it, in between nations, among societies, but also, and importantly, and I will zoom on, on this specifically now, in terms of their teaching and representation and researching. So is there an international relations problem in racism? I say yes, and in what way? I'd say in three ways. The first is historical. You might want to say archaeological. The discipline of international relations is explicitly and historically an outgrowth of a world system a century ago whose lineage is directly anchored in a race, racial construct of the world. Now, putting aside thinkers across civilizations and history that thought about international affairs generically, and so they are thinkers about international relations, whether these be Greek or Chinese, Arab, European, and so on, putting that aside, which is also part of the international history and politics of these things, the specific discipline of international relations, as we have come to know it in the modern era, it emerges about a century ago, essentially as a North American and European construct. That is why we speak later on of a Eurocentric construct. Now, there's nothing specifically problematic with that, except that in this particular context, as we tie to the problem of racism, the worldviews that the new discipline conveys incipiently, the problems it seeks to address as its mission, and for many, not all, but for many, the values it furthers explicitly or implicitly are not merely derivative, but immersed in a context where racism is the accepted norm and in fact, slavery a few years before. So we have here discipline whose very history, the deeper background is co-constitutive of that period's history and therefore the trajectory of the discipline as it is born. This particular DNA aspect of the IR has been noted already. John Hobson in particular, uh, Frank Furetti have written on this extensively important works. But interestingly and, and, and helpfully for this generation, only recently has the academic momentum started gathering some momentum uh, about this. Notably, I'd like to mention the work, the important work of University of Pennsylvania, Robert Vitalis, who produced a key book in 2015 entitled White World Order, Black Power Politics, The Birth of American International Relations, in which he documents painstakingly the trajectory, this particular trajectory I was summarizing, and the indelible relationship that it has with race. Bob Vitalis writes the following, the archives which he unearths reveal what amounts to a lost world of international relations. Scholarship buried under the schools of strategy, quote unquote, built in the 1950s and 60s. Let me stop there for a moment. I think that's exactly the identification of, as he calls it, importantly, a lost world that has been buried. And then these schools of thought, which we study and we teach and we replicate, have been then elevated on the pillars 
of such knowledge. I continue quoting the gentleman that history bears scant resemblance to the stories told in the field seminars in seminar rooms every semester where professional identities are continuously remade. These myths, that's a key word, have a strong hold over the profession. Of course, since then, a global discussion has been joined with others. Jessica Blatt has also written a book about this. Uh, Zeynep uh, Gulzat Kapan, Audrey Alejandro, many, many others have joined in this very rich and interesting and important discussion. It is not merely, therefore, that the discipline was discussing the state as a racist world. Sometimes it even dabbled itself in such racist views explicitly. The journal Mankind Quarterly, published since the 1960s, is essentially a white supremacist academic vehicle by its own focus, or indeed by lineage. The celebrated foreign affairs journal, which is today essentially the, the, the premier journal in the field, started interestingly, quote, as the journal of race development about a century ago. The second reason why there is a problem of racism in international relations is cultural, as in the culture of the discipline. Even when gradually in the face of international developments in the second half of the 20th century, it started, the field started recognizing the obvious importance of these race issues following decolonization or the so-called riots in the United States or tensions across a number of other societies, IR was still reluctant to address the question as a normal component of the curriculum of things, that is the things that needed to be studied. The result was even more problematic, a reaction whereby a number of scholars had to find so-called area studies to work on these questions. Thus, in the last quarter of the 20th century, you see the emergence of Black studies, Latino studies, Asian studies, MENA studies, which, as it were, most of them initially seldom dealt with the problem of international relations, oftentimes dealing with these questions societally, locally, in terms of those aspects. And so I think that such nichification from niche so to speak, was I think an insidious way to sideline the problem or to associate it with identity. And in effect, again, deflect its legitimate relevance to international affairs, which were then conceived globally in unspoken ways hierarchically. Those researching it were depicted as obsessed with or militants. Alternatively, one of course is not obsessed with migration security or into European integration enough. The third manner in which international relations denote racism, I would say, is behavioral. And here we move from the macro to the micro level. We're here at the level of the professors, but also the students. A human ecology of sorts emerged in the classroom whereby commentary, research, or focus on racism within the confines of IR was not encouraged. In fact, oftentimes it was discouraged by the professors around the world. U.S. foreign policy, Russian foreign policy, French foreign policy could be studied in all manners of variables and whatnot, while the racist tropes that drove those policies domestically, internationally, in between nations, think about the geopolitics of the assassination of Lubumba and what that tells us about Belgium, about the United States, about the Congo, about the Soviet Union, about China, about the UN, for instance. All of those things were not seen as uh, legitimate explanatory variables, as it were. And very problematically, the study of racism was largely left to black and brown scholars or students seen to be personally concerned with the issue, even when they were not necessarily. In the silent war, imperialism and the changing perception of race, Frank Furetti writes importantly, quote, that the silencing of race relations in that manner was symptomatic of a defensiveness about beliefs that were central to the outlook of these Western ruling classes. I think that's the crux of the matter. Knowledge, power, class, representation, discourse. We go here to Foucault, we go here to Said, to all of the uh, tropes that are familiar to us in unpacking these. Students travel the world, as I start wrapping up, Christine. Students travel the world to learn about IR professors in Western-dominated academia that have demonstrably little interest in this issue. They step in these classrooms, bringing with them the urgency of the breaking news about the latest killing, for instance, where the issue is rationalized or sidelined, made secondary to real politic and global sec security for decades on, as it were. Classrooms where truth be told, they can experience racism themselves. How are things in Africa? Tell us how it is back home. Sort of the identity based of 
how this discussion starts as opposed to an intellectual recognition of the students or the professor. Or students, and there's a lot of introspection needed here, can manifest it themselves when they unconsciously doubt the credentials of a brown or a black professor, but readily accept those of the white one, as it were. As Saida Qureshi wrote in the London Review of Books in November 2018, quote, present curricula assume that white men write about universal truths, while people of color are only expert in a narrow field, usually to do with questions of identity and heritage. And so ultimately, in conclusion, these three aspects I submit to you, history, culture, and behavior, mirror, as it were, the structure of racism itself, but they also speak to us, thus raising a challenge for our times and the times to come of depth and continuity of the problem. So where are we today? We stand today atop a construct of IR that is the direct recipient of this history of conformity. The, the awakening, and it is an important one with, that we are witnessing today on the issue of racism is the result of a reckoning, which is in fact, arguably an unraveling of the global practices and an IR edifice that is merely showing the cracks it had hit for such a long time. For far too long, racism has been masked under analyses, mythologizing the systemic inequality of the international status quo. The question today is how do we conserve ourselves with the evolution of global affairs in the next 30 years as we try to address this question, not so much because of the passing 2020 urgency, but rather because of the lasting impacts of the past century and how this has been indulged in that manner. I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Mahmoud, for this uh, excellent, timely, and very important uh, presentation, with, which I think enables us also to highlight the different levels at which you know, the issue of racism informs practices at the level of international relations, at the domestic level, of course, and we uh, have uh, lots of examples and of, uh, um, of facts which uh, also feed our, our reflections on, on that, but also at the level of the research, the students, and, and the scholarship, the IR scholarship. So I would like to to take you through the this different uh, levels with uh, perhaps a, a few questions before uh, taking the question from from the audience um we have now 121 participants and uh, we are keen on, on having your also comments questions from uh, uh, from you all those comments can be in, in english or french uh, uh, as as you prefer so mahmoud at the level of international relations um how can we identify or reveal uh, those practices that are informed by uh, racist constructs? Thank you, Christine. I think this is, can you hear me? Uh, yeah, thank you very much. I, I think your question is really the logical starting point, um, which is how we sort of exit out of this, if one accepts the, the the history, which I think is compelling enough, although, of course, we can discuss specific aspects of it. But I think to have a proper way out of a real problem, um, we it's incumbent on us to actually have a proper diagnosis. You know, in, in, in our field in international affairs, there's oftentimes this dictatorship of solutions. OK, great. So what do we do about this now? I think that's that's a that's a logical and the positive uh, sort of healthy, I feel like saying, kind of way out of this. But all the same, if we don't do a proper prognosis, we will time and again be brought back to this moment where we launch into a way to address it, to remedy it, and then not really seeing that our understanding of it was either blinded or incomplete and so on. So I think it's to the first answer to your question is to take the time, given the complexity and the layered aspect of the problem, to actually make sure that we have a proper understanding. After that, I think that any honest uh, sort of effort to fix this, and I, and I think it's, we're, talk, we're talking about fixing, you know, it's, it's, it's not going to do to have some of a superficial sort of, you know, change of, of, of the syllabus or the, the, the whole discussion about changing the syllabi that students actually led a couple of years ago in different parts around the world, in South Africa and the UK and the US, elsewhere, 
Um, but the reality of it is that we need a, a, a complete revisiting of what do we mean by international relations. And this connects to other aspects that take us beyond the problem of racism. What are the pieces of the puzzle? Are they only states? Do we bring other components, civil society, non-state actors, movements, citizens, issues that are already being dealt with by international relations themselves? And yet, the central component of the narrative, because it is bothersome to some, because it is related to the Eurocentric nature of the production of that knowledge, um, is still sidelined. And so this needs to be sort of completely put on the table and in a way, with a certain ambitious, the whole conversation rebooted. Um, if you're going to have a sort of an honest uh, discussion about this, otherwise, I think we will have this kind of you know false starts time and again, and things might be done and addressing it in this particular school of thought or that particular institution, right? But then again, as a whole, we will be still talking uh, using the same tools uh, we have inherited as a generation. And I think are problematically passing on to the next generation, which feel that something is wrong with that, isn't it? And is pushing back. That's why it's refreshing to see all of these movements around the world questioning uh, that received wisdom. Thank you for this. It's very uh, illuminating, in fact. And I, I, I understand one of the key dimension, and you you developed it in your talk, is the question of invisibility. So if we go to the second level uh, and the domestic kind of uh, arenas where uh, relationships, practices, uh, norms might be informed by a racist contract, what do you think of the current movements towards the representational redress, statues removed, etc.? How much of an impact do you see in this? It's a very important uh, issue which historians have been discussing. To cut to the chase, I think that there's a lot of hypocrisy in the argument that very quickly becomes defensive and says, well, that's how the world uh, was. This is our history. There's no real you know, merit in trying to sort of invisibilize that history and so on. Um, Obviously, history should not, cannot be staged. Obviously, it should be preserved. I, obviously, the very logic of archiving is about essentially going to represent what once was. But that's the work about what existed, what we can unearth, what we should shine light on that has not been addressed in many. History itself is guilty of racism in many ways by the way it's repre re represented around the world. But the question of statues is completely different. A statue is a celebration. It's something that you put as a pedestal, literally, in the, the middle of the city. It is something that therefore acquires a certain value that is the embodiment of what the community has decided it wants to celebrate. Now, if what you are celebrating is in and of itself anathema to the very values of your society, much less insulting to others, then obviously that is a problem. Who would be against sort of taking out a statue of Adolf Hitler standing in the middle of Berlin today simply because 50 years ago it was there and we can't take it because that's our history? You see the contradiction in that argument very rapidly. Now, it doesn't mean that we have to embark on a bureaucratic program of sort of taking out all of the sites around the world and, and staging and having this kind of you know, Orwellian outlook on our history, which is equally problematic. But all the same, you cannot simply by one go in saying that's how it was, we can't touch it. And in that way, sort of take out, I think, what essentially is a political message. And quite simply for me, a statue is a celebration. What are you celebrating? And it comes down to this. The rest is a matter of preserving. And you can have these detestable histories still surviving, which we need to know about. And we need to look at them and study them and have them and preserve them in their own way so that we are able to access what they once were, uh, as it were. Uh, but that's that's what I would say about this issue. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for, for this, which is uh, extremely, I think, uh, powerful, in fact. And another concept that uh, I think is, is very relevant uh, to our discussion that, and that you, you highlighted in, in your talk is the concept of racism's 
which is a pluralized uh, uh, version of racism. So the variety of racisms. How do you see this covered currently by the scholarship? Thank you very much. So this is actually a, a, an important topic we address a lot in the class that I co-teach with my colleague, Professor Davide Rodonio. And, and we call it racism or racisms. Uh, and we're really hard at the heart here of a, an, an, an epistemological issue. Is there one single racism that manifests itself in different versions that is spreading from the same essence, taking different colors, quote unquote, and representations and manifestations and forms and discourses and so on. And therefore, in studying it historically, you can reconstruct those components that, that make it the thing that it is, right? Or do you have, um, at the same time, separately, such a plurality of the manifestations of racism that you are inevitably having to address them, study them, research them in parallel tracks because they are so sort of self-contained and self-driven. So obviously a very important line of anti-black um, racism across the world, as it were. And then Islamophobia, anti-Semitism, anti-Roma, anti-this, anti-that. The racism that we saw materializing against Asians and Chinese specifically during the corona, which continues. Uh, the racism that takes a class form in Brazil um, within the complexity of that society, the racism that is driven by colonial heritage in a place like France or the UK with Southeast Asia. How do you relate to the two? And, and, it, and so, of course, there's a lot of uh, rich uh, academic work on this that has really given uh, a lot uh, of a very interesting material. At this stage, I would say that it would be intellectually um, uh, mis a mistake to actually look at it as an either or kind of problem. There is a place in that discussion where the, the drivers of racism do sort of correlate and you can speak to the problem in this universal way that you see racism as a discourse, as an ideology, as a political program of action, as a dehumanizing kind of um, uh, process. And therefore, as something that is relevant to our international relations, that's that's the point I've been making. Um, and so preserving that helps us, in a way, speak the same language of uh, a universal discussion about this, a global discussion, we would say today. But all the same, I think it's perfectly possible, and our students do it in the class when they go and do their research for their papers, you can then zoom in on the specific case there to unearth that specific history and see what you can bring from the case of that community or that actor or that problem or that history to the larger uh, context of the problem. So I think it's a two-step, two-speed, uh, mutually reinfor reinforcing production of knowledge. Uh, to the audience, feel free to uh, type in your, your questions and we will uh, take them as uh, they arrive. In the meantime, I, I think, Mahmoud, one uh, also very topical kind of questions that we would like to ask you is about the U.S. and its current context. So to what extent is this idea of race uh, shaping, reshaping um, the American society in the Trump Trump-led area. Thank you very much. Well, it's an extremely important question. I think we all have been following this over the past few years, a few months. It has accelerated, um, and, and it's pretty bad. I think it, it's very, very important not to try here to sort of, you know, speak about an alarmist uh, kind of uh, discourse. Um, or even a sense of drift. We've seen some pieces speaking about the US drifting. I think it's, it's as bad taking that society uh, in places where it was in the late 60s, early 70s. You know, there's talk these days of sort of a, a cultural civil war and, and the weaponization of that we see taking place across these communities speaks even beyond the cultural prism as it were. There are several reasons to that. I would say the first one, uh, which is above and beyond the Trump phenomenon uh, or actions that he took, 
uh, is the fact that, and this connects to my earlier point, Christine, about the fact that this issue was some thought that it was solved, the fact that this society never dealt fully with this question. In other parts, and again, as when we speak about the US, we shouldn't forget what we're just discussing, the global aspect. So a country like France has a similar problem in its own way related to its colonial history. But in the United States, the problem was really, never really dealt with. The marches of the 1960s, the, 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 the vignettes uh, that we see uh, took over and produced a narrative of closure, as if this issue was dealt with and then we moved on to other things, that the racial question became one of class, of poverty, of neighborhoods, and as we go into the Reagan era and the Clinton era. In fact, this was never dealt with. The, the tropes of the, what was produced by the racism of society, as the Kerner report writes in 1967, uh, this is the report that was produced by the congressional team after the riots, they, it literally sort of puts the blame at the feet of society itself. I think that's the kind of discussion that was then sort of swept under the rug as we go into the next phase. So never dealt with, never resolved, as the decades passed by specific uh, uh, pol policies made that worse. Certainly, and I would stop on this uh, so we can maybe hear from, from the, the colleagues online, the actions by the president themselves are absolutely explicitly directly and by design racist what we have today is a sitting president in the white house which is racist which endorses a racist ideology which has taken racist policies and has pushed people to that it gets worse by the day just recently he was talking even of um eugenism kind of uh flavored logic when he spoke about a group of his supporters telling them you have good genes. This is coded language. This is dog whistling about ra race, not even racism, uh, amidst the society that thought that it had sort of sublimated, went beyond that, solved it. Uh, and certainly not because of the election of President Obama, who did not solve the problem and in many quarters made it worse. Uh, starting with African Americans, uh, for that matter. But the, the actions of the president uh, the current president were explicitly part of his political program, which which has the merit of at least being in your face, quite straightforward. It lands all of this today, and the election is not going to solve this. It lands it in a place where society is sick, where that society has now to find ways to address this. And in a way, at least it has the merit of having sort of punctured um, at the issue and brought it to uh, uh, the sort of the front row and everyone can now address it if they so choose. But I think it's going to get worse before it gets better, certainly uh, when it comes to this particular country. So I'm, I'm now clubbing a few questions. Uh, thank you to the audience for, for those. Uh, so that on, on, on the US was also in a way to gather a few of them. But specifically, there is uh, Nana Maria Maiga, who is a Grad Institute alumni watching from Geneva, who is asking you if you believe that the implication of that Black Lives Matter is a domestic issue by international organizations? Is this very invisibilization and rational banalization that you discussed? Thank you. Thank you, Nana, for your question. Um, I think the Black Lives Matter movement is a very important movement. I think in many ways it's the continuation of all of these movements that the country has known for, for many years. Interestingly, as I said, as the sort of momentum slows down in the 80s, 90s, such movements kind of lose visibility. They've always remain active. There's a lot of militancy uh, across white and uh, black, for that matter, and other communities in the United States on this issue. But it does not sort of occupy the space that we see after Ferguson in 2014, which is has the merit of having a new generation take the issue forward, as I said, because they kind of rediscover it particularly African-Americans that had thought that they were functioning now in a society that had become quote unquote, quote unquote colorblind, as they say in the UK. And now they realize that that legacy is now not necessarily what they were told or thought themselves when they discovered the systemic nature of it. New momentum, new blood, uh, new sort of uh, methods, of course, as we see, um, that are themselves globalizing. Uh, I think it's a great development. I think it's an important and successful movement. Uh, it was very interesting positively to see it expand uh, in recent months around the world as um, youth around the world, which was guilty 
uh, of not really engaging with the problem itself in Europe, in, in the Middle East, in Asia, and other parts of the world on this issue, started making the connections and speaking to that uh, population. But I would say the, the Black Lives Matter remains still slightly, uh, for me, provincial. I think it would benefit from, from connecting more internationally on this issue and specifically going back to something that um, in his, the last year of his life, Malcolm X started developing, which is a narrative about the racism in the United States as a human rights problem. That this language of human rights, which the civil rights movement was not using, I think is the more logical and the more sort of um, uh, fertile to explain that these violations correlate with everything we understand as human rights across the world. And that will give it far more resonance and possibly a way to address it and solve it by using those, those connections. Leaving it only to the US, for the US actors, for the African-American militants, I think is a replication more of the same. They may or may not be uh, successful, uh, but the issue concerns all of us um, um, as humans as actors, uh, as inhabitants of, of this world. And I think it's in that way that it becomes far more interesting should they choose to internationalize it uh, as it were. Some American scholars started doing that uh, a lot. Uh, and many of them actually um, um, uh, sort of um, have started writing along those, uh, those uh, lines. Thank you for your question. We, we have uh, many questions, so let me try to take the most of them uh, uh, as long as time permits. We aim at, to close at 1.30. So uh, if you can have a brief answer to a complex question or many brief answers to many complex questions, the first uh, one that I'm taking now, uh, which is again, uh, and we have a number of questions related to methodology, to uh, IR scholarship and to the role of the Grand Institute and to students. So let me take uh, Mahmoud Samandari's uh, uh, question from Geneva. What are the three most important and prevalent assumptions that need to be challenged in IR on the topic of racism? Well, top of, uh, top of my head, the, 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 the structure of the curriculum, not so much in the, what book or this or that, but the issues themselves, the, the way the state-centric nature of IR has been examining great powers as the drivers of these global politics and as a result seeing all of these uh, derivative issues as places where those those power struggles are projected um, so this kind of top-down um, understanding of things that doesn't say it in those terms but is fundamentally problem secondly the question of security which is understood primarily in terms of the security of the state or the security of the west or migrants coming this way or this or that the security that is understood in ways that the racism that is prevalent also is a creator of insecurities. What does that mean? How can we pack that? How can we have a large sort of agenda where we can go and research and, 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 and discover? This is not uh, essentially to download. This is to invite a discussion on things that is not there. And thirdly, as I said, the behavioral dimension of it, of how do we approach these questions? That racism is not only an issue for the African student in the room or the Asian one, or the person that somehow someone would feel that it is, that you have these um, European actors uh, looking at it. The, the taboo, uh, to the person who asked the question, the taboo is the following, that as you go into an international relations program, the unspoken reality is that the white students have to work on security and IR and that the brown and black students have to work on development. That's the bottom line. And that's how we replicate it. So that's the one, one, two, three way to start with and addressing this. Take a, take a journal like, I don't know, the, the MIT International Security. Go through the articles. What are they really talking about in terms of the international security? And how come one of the main things around us, all around us, is not present in that discussion or present minimally, as it were, to be fair to them? So I would start there, for instance. Thank you. In fact, there is uh, Shiri Anderson, Elvia Leon, who are asking what can be done in schools such as ours, where the institute to counteract. And uh, Olivia is asking specifically, uh, what is our role at, at the Grad Institute and what should be the role of academia for discouraging such, such issue? 
Thank you very much. Well, I think to do what we're doing right now, first of all, there's several colleagues here at the Institute that are engaged in this conversation. It's not only those that I mentioned, and my colleague and I, but there is quite a few that have been writing about these issues, that are having uh, publishing about it in the sociology department, in the law department. Um, there is a sense that you have this issue already, I think, as a project. I think the, uh, the fundamental question to your point about what should we do about this, I would place it both at the feet of those that produce the, 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 the knowledge and disseminate it, but also at the, at the receiving end of those that, that are studying it, that they themselves have to see the importance of these issues. The, the fundamental dissonance for me comes from the fact of, as a student, you, 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 you function in a world out there where this issue is all around you a lot more these months, but has long been. And yet you step in in classrooms, as, as I was saying in my talk, where this issue gradually becomes sort of muted, uh, consciously or unconsciously. This is not a way of throwing the stone at anyone, but it, it, it becomes simply irrelevant. And when you raise it yourself or the professor that is interested in this, it sounds almost like a strange animal in that discussion. When the point is, why should it be a strange animal when the plethora of issues, environment and health and gender and all of these questions that are about the world we inhabit have graduated to a solid place as they should in international relations. And yet this one remains on the sidelines, on the periphery. It's coming to us in this discussion, not through our work, but through the current affairs. Isn't this paradoxical that us, the producers of knowledge, are supposed to turn on the TV and read the articles and or look at the media to say, oh, this is important, we should study it. This is completely backwards. It should be that we identify its importance, put it as a central edifice of the knowledge, communicate it to it. And by the way, addressing that will make that world that we're talking about much more sort of free of these elements that are creating that sort of insecurity that, that is so important to us as such. Um, yeah, so you said short answers. That was a medium. Uh, let me take uh, Tiaji Seo's uh, comment and question. Uh, thank you for the insightful presentation. Actually, you have a lot of comments of, of thanks uh, for this uh, excellent presentation. Uh, so uh, Tiaji is a, a black German diplomat and joins the session from Vietnam. Uh, he says, I completely agree with your assertions and was wondering how we can harmonize growing nationalist tendencies and current social justice movements. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for your question. Thank you for joining us from, from over there. Um, I think you, you, you mentioned something that I did not mention in my talk, which is highly relevant, social justice. Uh, and of course, the nationalism it, sort of Intuitively, the nationalism, the, sort of the negative nationalism, shall we say, or the, the patriotism that generates all of these uh, racist ideologies is part of the problem. And it's been reinvigorated, and not just in the US. We can look at this in, in Germany, in France, in Spain, in Italy, look at what's happening in Hungary, but also in the global south. And I'd like to insist on that. This is not, the, Europe has a cancerous problem of racism, as I said, and the United States has never solved its own slavery issue as it were. But the racism in the midst of Sub-Saharan Africa, North of Africa, the Middle East, Asia, elsewhere, Latin America, is equally part of this issue. That is why we cannot contradict ourselves methodologically in saying there's a Eurocentric kind of thing, and then we sort of only deal with that. This is a global problem, which makes it important for us to deal with. And I think in dealing with it, connecting it to the previous question in the agenda, one connects it with such the, uh, sort of notional conceptual issues such as nationalism, such as the rise of authoritarianism as we see materializing. What ideologies drive it? How does this function? How does it actually unearth a certain kind of, of rhetoric? and speaking to the insecurities of these communities, which are then rationalized by scholars. You've, I'm sure you've heard about the argument that it is because these communities in, in the US felt threatened economically after 2008 and so on, and so that explains the rise of Trump. By so doing and providing all the statistics that a political scientist will neatly put there for you, and political science is particularly guilty of indulging this racism problem in international relations, then you almost come to kind of, um, explain that this is a logical, normal thing, that that's why Trump is there. 
Well, no, that is because you can certainly see that those manifestations of it are obviously the instrumentalization of a feeling of nationalism, of identity, of pride about one's culture that doesn't need to be against anyone else or to simply be a vehicle for venting because one missed on globalization, the gilets jaunes, or because one is opposed to this or that. It, it, there's a sense where that conversation, in enriching it, takes us to have a more nuanced debate about nationalism, authoritarianism, democracy, things that the center, by the way, where Christine is, uh, are doing, is doing. So, uh, in fact, there are a lot of questions from students about the role of our institute department, but I, let me take another set of questions to, before we, we have to close uh, this session, which is on uh, the role of international organizations and practitioners. And I'm taking now uh, Smruti Ran Mohan's question from India. How would you view the role of the Committee of the Elimination of Racial Discrimination in Combating Racism? And then I'm also clubbing this with uh, Garen Steller's question. We have actually many questions, so thanks a lot to the audience, and I'm sorry uh, because I don't think we will manage to take them all, but uh, I'm, I'm trying to cover at least the themes or to, uh, to provide them uh, as, as also food for thought for the uh, continuation of the conversation. And Garen uh, is uh, writing, as someone who works in foreign affairs, not in a position of influence, I would be interested in knowing what we practitioners can do to challenge in constructive ways some of the assumptions on which international relations are based. Thank, thank you for these questions and thank you also for bringing this other dimension which I had mentioned earlier. Talking about international relations is both in the practice and the conceptualization and the study beyond current affairs. I, I think the, the two questions are, are important in connecting us with I think what could be done much, much, much better at the level of international organizations, the UN specifically, and then national diplomacy. Uh, and then some specific committees or national organizations that are meant to fight against racism. Very quickly on that, Christine, because I know we're, we're running out of time. I, um, so I, I had a chance to be at the R R Durban Conference uh, on Racism back in 2001. And I remember the lead up to that, where a lot of work was done, and actually good work was done by the preparatory committees, the UN, all of that bureaucratic reality is still there. But there was a lot of, of thinking around these questions of how this major issue, which was coming on the heel of these big international conferences, human rights, development, women, Beijing, all of that. So racism was actually, up until a week before 9-11, very much in the news as it were in 2001 in those questions. I think we need to, sir, we need to go back to that. We need to re-engage with that discussion and not leave it to the arcanes of committee 23 in room X. And so it's only a few specialists talking to themselves and in a very convoluted UNE's language. It needs to be given a sense of urgency. The leadership in these organizations need to bring it to, in a, in, a, in a way that disseminates it to the wider public. There's a literacy exercise to be done, which connects with the national level. I think we need to bring this question much more alive in the curricula of schools and high schools. There's a lot of this happening already among uh, teenagers and children that need to be uh, sort of, they need to see this question much earlier. With my colleague David Elodoni in our class, we find that students oftentimes are really exposed to a, an intelligent discussion about this for the first time, and that they know intuitively about it and they see it, but they have never come across it in the curriculum of things. So I think given those, um, that investment early on would allow them to come to graduate studies with a stronger kind of footing and to be able to engage with, with that. And finally, the national committees working on this have to go beyond simply a logic of listening to or helping. It's, it's kind of a, it needs to be much more programmatic. Uh, it's not simply an emotional, sympathetic lending an ear. It is about essentially addressing this as a lingering issue in the society. And that calls for proper leadership. Thank you. I think we arrived exactly at the, importantly, already closing time for this uh, extremely uh, interesting and important conversation. Thank you for uh, to bring this uh, today, uh, Mahmoud, and uh, thank you to all the audience. I think we had more than uh, 
I don't see the figure anymore, but uh, 200 people connected, about 50 questions now. I mean, all questions arrived uh, uh, as we are uh, almost wrapping up, or many questions arrived now, and I'm sorry, I couldn't even take some of the earlier ones. Um, there is uh, a great interest and uh, among this, uh, among the Grad Institute's uh, community, but also uh, more generally in this issue. So I think it was very important to have it discussed uh, today. And uh, if we aim at uh, continue this conversation as we really, really do at the Institute and with you, Mahmoud and Davide, I think we might also think of opportunities of forum to discuss it. And I think there was also uh, one or two comments on that, encouraging us to, to go uh, in this uh, in this direction. So I think I would leave it here. Would you like to say uh, something in conclusion? You would still have a minute or so to, to conclude, Mahmoud. Very briefly, Christine, simply a word of thanks to you and the colleagues for the kind invitation. And, and a warm thanks to everyone that tuned in and for the excellent question that, that were raised. And I'm sorry we couldn't address all of them, but that's the nature of the exercise. But I really appreciate that there's a there's an, an understanding and, and a sort of a, a realization, which I know was there anyway amongst many uh, about this. So many thanks. It's been a pleasure. And uh, again, let's continue the conversation and let's start the work. I mean, specifically to the students and to the younger scholars. They really need now to get into this whole discussion to provide us with more food for thought and more work as it were. And, uh, and a special thanks to you, Christine, for kindly uh, doing this very, uh, very elegantly. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.